Greetings and welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm for another project video. The uh, project at hand is going to be making a little octagonal rolling tool, rollout toolbox for a set of bone and antler carving tools that I'm planning to make for myself this fall and winter. Now, this is a small project that doesn't need huge cuts of wood, and I thought it would be a good opportunity to talk about sources of free and low-cost wood that's actually good wood for small projects. Most people, when they start talking about free and low-cost wood, they're thinking about pulling nails out of boards, salvage lumber, pallets, things like that, and most of that is junk. I'm really pretty down on those things as sources of wood for good projects. Yes, once in a while you find a gem, a real diamond in the rough, that's worth the time to dissect it for little scraps. But most of the time it's trash. And if you're going to spend a large investment of your time into a really nice project, you don't want to start with trash wood. You want to start with nice wood. But there are sources that you can luck into from time to time of free and low cost wood that's really worth investing in. My favorite source is slabbing. Okay? When a mill cuts a log, they have to cut the round out. Boards are square, logs are round, and they're never shaped the way you want them to. So there's a lot of waste that comes off the outside of a log. Okay? That's, that's what this is a chunk of waste from the outside of a log, in this case, a cherry log. And mills have to cut this out, and they have to cut it down, and they have a customer with a certain order, and they've got to get the boards out of the log that the customer wants. And depending on the size of the board that the customer wants, there can be quite a bit of waste. And it's really sad, because if you think about how a tree grows, it always has branches near the top of a tree at a certain point. So when the tree's yay tall, it's got all branches. It grows up, has more branches, and the lower branches die off and leave knots and rot and holes and the blemishes. But then the tree grows out and covers those. So when you're looking at the trunk of a tree, the consistent best wood is on the outside, not the inside. So when you have to take the slabbing off, what you're actually taking off is some of the best wood, cleanest wood, nicest carving wood on that tree. And this is why for small projects, I'm always, as I'm stacking up my firewood pile, I'm always keeping my eye out for chunks that are worth something. Last time I went and got a load of firewood, and I get the slabbing for 20 bucks a pickup truck load, um, they had just cut a bunch of cherry, and I got these nice, nice, big chunks of cherry for slab wood prices. Now, can you cut a board out of this? Absolutely not. This is not something that you want to do if you're going to go, you know, build a piece of case furniture. But I do a lot of carving. And the toolbox I want to make for my carving tools, I am going to make out of solid chunks and then carve with a gouge the concavities to put the individual tools in. So I'm looking for big two to four inch thick chunks of wood for this project. And I just might get enough out of this pile of wood to accomplish that. So let's take a few minutes and talk about how to split and dissect these chunks into usable stock for a future carving project. Before we actually start splitting logs, I want to talk a minute about the tool that I'm using. This is called a fro. If you have seen the earlier series in car on carving ducks, you will have seen me splitting large chunks of pine slabbing in order to carve the duck bodies. That's very imprecise, and I was using large wedges and axes in order to split out big chunks of wood. And pine is extraordinarily soft, so I'm deliberately making them quite a bit oversized and then just ripping off the excess with a draw knife. That's efficient for that purpose. And that pine slabbing I get for literally free and I can get it in basically unlimited quantity. So I'm not worried if I mess one up. It's not a big deal, it'll just go in the campfire. This cherry is a little harder to come by and a bit more expensive if you're buying it as cherry. So if I mess up a piece 
and I have to go and buy cherry as sawn cherry, that's going to be a dollar a board foot. And I want to make sure that I get enough pieces out of this little pile that I have to complete my project. So I'm going to use the more precise tool. The fro is a wedge on a handle. What you're going to do is pound the wedge in, and then you twist the handle, and you can get a very controlled split. Now, if you look at this one, I'm just going to hold it across this board as sort of a straight edge there for perspective. If you look at this one, you can see that there's a bit of a belly in the top. That comes from striking it with steel tools. Never strike your fro with steel tools. You always want to strike it with a wooden mallet. Now you're saying, oh, I'm new to this. I don't have a wooden mallet yet. Yes, you do. Go find a stick. I trust you. You can find a stick. Now, while talking about the tool, one of the things that you need to know about a fro is that the eye is always tapered, okay? This is so that you can knock the handle out and collapse it for carrying or sharpening. Put it back on, give it a stamp and it should hold. Now this handle, I wish there was a little bit more projecting there because it's a little bit hard to get pounded in truly correctly. But, you want to resist the temptation that a lot of people have. You'll often see people taking wooden handle tools that are made this way to come apart and get frustrated that the handle taps out from time to time. It's a feature, not a bug. When people get frustrated with it, they'll often want to soak it in water. Don't ever do that. Two reasons. One, it's going to rust your tool. Bad. Second, when these cells get soft and expand, they crush. So then when it dries, it will um, exacerbate the problem that you've been having of this tool handle falling out. Now, in the clips you're about to see of me splitting wood, there's a couple times where it falls out. That's okay. That's a feature of this handle design, not a bug. Next, we want to consider the material that we're actually working with. I need to get 10 pieces of wood out of this little stack of slabbing in order to make my project. If I miss by a piece, that's okay. I can just go buy it. But this stuff I bought for $20, a pickup truck load, if I go buy it, it's going to be a dollar a board foot. Now, at the scale that I'm working, I ain't going to break the bank. I'm happy to go buy it if I miss my piece. But I'd still like to get everything out of this one batch. The 10 pieces I need, I need one 6 by 4 and a half, one 6 by 2 and 8 that are 2 by 4 and a half. I should be able to get that out of this stack without too much trouble, as long as I use my wood efficiently. So let's take a look at some of what I got. I got this one piece that is already a nice two inch thick board. And you'd say, oh, well you can rip this into multiple sections. But there's this big chunk of rot in it here. And if I flip that over, you can see it's really pronounced on this side. And I have this bark coming in. Okay, that's called wain, when you have bark and sloping material from the outside of the log in a board. So I'm really only gonna get one strip about there. I'll rip that with a rip saw later on. So this I'm not gonna split today. That's just gonna go on the pile because this should dry without cracking pretty easily. So we'll just chuck him over there. This is by far the best piece. Nice and thick. I could get anything that I want out of it. And it's, it's fairly flat across the top and it's flat in this direction, so both ends are approximately the same thickness. I can get a lot out of this. But this is my best piece. I don't know what I need to get out of this. Let me explain why. We'll throw him aside too. This is sort of an average piece. It's, it's still nice and thick. Okay, that's the narrow end but it has problems. I've got a knot here, I've got a knot here, and if I flip it over, you see I've got a big section of rot here. So the, the piece I, I showed you a moment ago, I know I can get any piece I want out of that. 
But I don't know what piece I want out of that until I see what piece I'm able to get out of this. So these pieces with blemishes are where I will actually start work. I will start dissecting them, trying to get the largest piece from my cutting list possible. See what I get. And then at the end of this exercise, I can go to pieces uh, like the previous one and get whatever I need to finish off my cutting list. So start with your worst stuff first. So let's actually split some wood. I pull the chopping block to protect the bottom of my tools. This is just a, another chunk of junk from over in the firewood pile that has no utility whatsoever. That truly is a chunk of junk. And this is that piece that I was talking about just a minute ago. Now, what I want to do in reducing this is remove the trash. Remove the known garbage. Okay? So I can look at this and I can see that this is garbage. This will not be in any finished piece. And I just want to start removing that and then see what I'm left with and then make another decision after that point. So I'm going to turn this just so it's convenient for me to be able to get in on it. I'm going to set the fro here. And we're just going to make some discoveries. I don't know what I'm going to find in here. But I will baton this down in. Then start to have my handle fall out. And start to split it. And this has some weird grain in it. Okay? Not uncommon. Cherry splits very easily when it is nice, even grain. So the fact that this is fighting me so much is telling me that there is something going on inside of this. And there you can see it. Remember those knots I showed you? You can see how this split is propagating in a very strange direction. It's, it's fine that that's loose. It's supposed to be loose. It's actually a collapsible tool so that you can pack it. Mm. That's normal. The air's been so dry, I'm not surprised at that. This one would be a candidate with a wet, for a wedge, with as grumpy as that's being. Now I can get it set better. And twist, lower the fro and twist, and pop out your piece. Okay. So, we found this is the end of a stub. This is an old knot that's rotted out. And it's growing in a weird direction. So we can't count on any of the rest of this wood being straight. This is certified genuine firewood. We're just going to stack it up there. Okay. Now, Let's go for the next most obvious problem, which is that knot. And we'll split that out. Now, just like you saw with the weird grain there, you can see this knot, I can see the grain diving and going in this way. So I'm going to give this knot a little bit of space. I want to stay as close to it as I can, but I am definitely going to give it some space. We'll see how much huffing and puffing this is going to cause me. Okay, good. That's more normal what I would expect from Cherry. Cherry usually splits quite nicely. That's straighter grain. Okay? So, this is also a piece of genuine certified firewood. Now I'm just looking at it. What do I have? What do I have? What do I want to work with? 
Okay? This is pretty narrow. See what we are there. That's just under two inches. So that's useful, but not really where I want to go. My smallest cut is two by four and a half. What's my width? My width here is about five and a half. So I'm going to take one more small piece off here. This will probably run out a little bit because it's a small, thin piece against the back. Yeah, definitely ran out. But that did straighten it a little bit. Okay. Now what do I have at that juncture? Just about exactly two inches. That'll be okay. Now where's four and a half from here? Four and a half is right there. Do I dare? I don't think I dare. I'm not going to mess with that. What I am going to do is try to get a little bit of this off. Now this ran out in that direction because the thinner, more flexible piece will tend to run toward the outside when you're splitting with a fro. That's normal. You can see I'm starting to get a little bit of straightness. I'm, I don't want to split any more here, but if I start up, up here, that will run out in this way. And I can get a little bit more of that mass off. So I'm going to come over. I want four and a half, so I'm going to split it about five, which is right about there. Put the fro there. Just give it a whack to mark it. Now I will position my piece so I can get at it easily. This is that gnarly grain, so it's probably going to fight me a little. Not too bad. How's it going? Okay. This is the advantage of a fro over an axe, where you can see where my split's going. It's going in too much. I don't want that. So I'm going to quit right where I am. Okay? That's not a problem yet, but it does want to angle in that direction. It would become a problem. So what I can do is I can set this aside to dry and then come in with a hatchet or a saw and just cut in, point it that way, and chop in or cut in to that mark. And that'll be just fine. That is about five inches right there. About five inches right there. And if something wonky happens in here, I still have a half inch to play with. So that's okay. Now, the last thing I want to do is I want to split off a little bit of this sapwood. But I'm not going to get too greedy with it because I know it's wanting to slope in that direction. I don't want to lose too much of my length. So I'm going to start a thin cut and I want it to run out on this side. I do need to hold this and pull this toward me to make it work. I know it's hard to see on the camera, but there I'll show you what I'm, what progress I'm making. Okay. Drive it down a little bit, then give it a twist, and then get annoyed that it's falling off the handle. This is always more difficult to do with a good camera angle. Okay? 
I might be able to just rip that off at this point. Yeah. See, that did what I wanted to. You see, I was running toward the outside because this is thin and flexible, and this is very much not. That's normal behavior. Let me get in again here a bit. blank that we will drive from this log. And we will count that as one of the small pieces. The rest of this I will do a little bit of trimming with a, ha with a hatchet, but most of the rest of the trimming will happen after it's dry with a draw knife. Now that we're finished with the fro on this piece, I want to show you a little bit of the hewing. First, hewing safety. Don't bring your stroke in toward you. Always take your stroke away, okay? Second of all, you're not allowed to put your hand here. Put your hand here, you come down, you have issues. This is how you lose thumbs. Always have your hand to the side and the side opposite where you're chopping, okay? So now with those two tips in mind, I'm gonna cut towards, well, away from me, not towards me, and I'm not gonna have my hand up here, okay? So, since we already have this split, I'm really just trying to shave the side and come in from the top where I can't get the fro in productively. And I know that this cut is not going to go in too far because I always have that split from the other end. And you don't need an expensive hatchet for this. This is just a cheap hardware store hatchet. And then I've got some cuts there. My hatch is starting to stick. So I'm just gonna pop them off. See, that was a little more in toward me, but still it caught in the, in the stump. This is green wood. It's real easy to work with these tools. Albeit somewhat awkward to show on camera. came down to our split, got that chunk off, trim a little, okay, good stuff, good stuff. Now I do want to take a little bit more of this off, just kind of true it up to that spot. So I'm going to tip it a little bit, cut straight in. And then come up and cut down to those cuts. From there, just drop it. The whole thing. You get stuck in there close to the edge, just drop both together. And you'll pop that off. Okay. So that's a lot straighter. Cross here. It's plenty for now. Um, I do want to get the bark off. Okay. See where my hand is? Not here. Put that over a little bit. one blank cut out. 
Now this still has more than twice the wood that will be in the finished piece. But it's now a reasonable size that I can expect this will dry reasonably well without checking too badly. So that's piece number one of eight in the small size. Okay, so let's look at another piece. This one has different opportunities and challenges than the last one. The last one right there had all sorts of problems, but there was tons of space to work. Okay, This one has basically no problems. You look, the green, I'm just going to trace it with my finger here, is dead straight down the length of this. Okay, I see no knots. If I look at the bark side, it's smooth all the way around. It's straight. There's no reason to believe that there are any blemishes in this log. Okay. The challenge is in the curvature. It comes down to a very fine edge on both sides. Okay. So what I need to do on this piece is make sure I can split anything I want out of it, but I need to make sure I get my full two inch width. So if I measure here to where the heart would, comes in at two inches. I'm just going to make myself some little marks. Okay. Now if I come over, five inches is there. Do I still have it's just a little bit under two inches? It's still two inches thick, but it's not all heartwood. That's okay. So I'll come over. Again, I'm leaving lots of excess here. and I'm just going to tap this, make a mark, okay? So those two marks are five inches apart. I want four and a half inches width, okay? They're five inches apart. This is full two inches of heartwood. This is more than two inches of log, but it's not all heartwood. So there would be some sapwood streak. I'm okay with that. I actually kind of like the sapwood streak. So we're going to go split down there and I'm going to start on this one because it's narrower. And if this goes awry, I can move this one over and have a little bit more thickness to work with on that side. Mm -hmm. So I'll just get it where I can give it a good whack. some of those fibers. I'll talk to you about what's going on here in a minute. We found something interesting, very interesting, Ugh, as soon as I can get this off. Now, okay, there we go. This one has a wave in the green. So that's actually curly cherry. So it's straight green, but it's got a little bit of curl in the wood right through there. That's nice. I'm not unhappy about that at all. 
but you can see how it went really straight on one angle, but not so much on the other. That's not going to split well. This is going to have to be cut with a saw. So this one won't split. I'm still going to get a piece out of it, but I'm going to have to do it the hard way with a handsaw. So that's a little bit sad, but I will get some very nice wood out of it. And I can do a little bit of this, especially on that piece, just by chopping. And chop through some of that curl and straighten up that split I already did. piece won't split well with a fro. So you have to go to other techniques. It'll be pretty when it's done. Can you see that wave right in it there? It'll be pretty. You'll have a little bit of chatoyancy in that direction. Holly, what does chatoyancy mean? It's an effect of the light when the grain is in opposite directions that looks like a water ripple, is what it means. Okay. What it actually translates to, I think it's Latin. What it translates to literally from the Latin, I'm not 100% sure. But it has the change in reflective pattern that makes the light play against the grain. Um, Tiger's Eye Stone is a chatoyant stone, mm -hmm. gemstone. So there's other things beyond this that have chatoyancy, but it always has a, it's a material with a grain pattern that ripples. And then when you cut flat through it, when the cells are in one direction, they reflect light one way. And then when they're flat, they reflect light, light another. So it's sort of like an iridescent water ripple kind of appearance. So that'll be a very nice looking piece. It's worth the effort. But I'm going to have to use different methods to go at it. This one split in the fortunate direction and ran out so I could just chop it. I can't guarantee that this side will also be that lucky. So I'm not going to split it. So this is going to be another small piece. But we're going to put it on the done pile for now. I'll either cut that with a saw or just hew it all the way down with the hatchet. Off it goes. So we're making some progress. I've made it through most of the cruddy pieces, except for one that's got some real weird stuff. I'm hoping I don't have to use this one, but we'll see. This is a, a nice piece. And at this point, I can start to ask, what do I need? Because I can get more than one piece out of this. I should be able to either get two of the two by four pieces or the a two by four piece and the two by six piece that I need for my little project. I've gotten six of the two by four pieces already and the big chunk for the middle, the four and a half by six, those are already in the bag. I've got them. I need two more two by fours and that um, two by six chunk. So I'm going to try and get one two by four and the two by six out of this one. Then I can get the last two by four out of this nice one, and that can just be in reserve if something goes wrong. So that's not a bad place to be in. So we'll put him up. And I just measured to where the heartwood is two inches thick. We're just going to go right in. And we have a nice split. Contrary to what some of those early ones would have you believe, Cherry usually splits like this. I was working with the cruddy pieces first. That is a perfect, nice, straight split. I love it. Now we can measure. I have a full foot to work with. So I can do this. I'll, I'll take a 5 inch and a 7 inch. That's more like six and a half. That's okay. Just put it 
because I don't want to risk the big one. So I'll put that fro a little bit to the inside of that. And I'll check. Four and three quarters there, just shy of seven there. Since I need four inches and six inches, that's going to give me a little over length for a split to get wonky. and a half there, four and a half there, so that will be easily the little over four that I need. This one I got seven, with the narrowest dimension, <laughs> six right on the nose, that's a little too close for comfort, but she still worked, and then these both need to be two inches, so I'll come up at three. Just kind of put a little mark here. Just using the hatchet blade as a scribe. Again, giving myself a little extra length. By the way, when you're doing this, this yourself, it's much easier to stand up to swing this. I'm making life harder, but I'm trying to keep it so that you can see what I'm doing on the film. It's probably going to, it's definitely going to run out to the outside. That's okay. going to run out a lot. It's fine. We did get a nice big chunk off. Do the same from the other side. There's very, very little risk of this operation coming too, more, too, too far into the meaty side. Especially with that being removed already. And again, I want it two inches. I'm measuring it three inches. Give that a little tap. And we got a nice split. That's a piece of firewood, and that's a beautiful blank. So coming from both directions like that can work quite nicely. We have three inches there. The narrowest here, we have two and a quarter. We only need two. So this is why you give yourself extra width when you're doing this, seven there. Just on six at the narrowest, which is right where I want it, but I would have liked to have an extra quarter, but it is still okay. That's a piece. So there's my two big sections. Chunk of firewood. There we go. Now I will treat this the same as I did that one and keep proceeding making pieces. We have our 10 blanks. It has been a successful preliminary project. These are the stock that will make my eight external little small drawers that will roll out around a central core as octagonal toolboxes do. 
they are all oversized, right? This one is probably closest to its intended size, and that one's closest because I hewed it instead of splitting it. When I got into this one, I discovered it was another one that has the quilted grain structure in it. So it'll be a really pretty drawer, but I had to hew it, which is a little bit more work than just running a split down, but I wanted to make sure I got a good piece out of it. And the board, of course, I haven't cut out the rod. I want to see where it checks, and I'll cut around the checks and rod and make the best compromise there. So I'm just going to leave it full size. These will dry much better in this form than if you leave them half round. If you square them off, you will get a bit less checking. Now, in something this size, if you have a little bit of checking, it's not going to fall apart, right? Often, those checks will open up, and then as it dries, they'll close the rest of the way down. Um, these pieces will make my interior, the core of it. So this will be, put it that way, this will be up, this will be the top that gets hollowed out, and then it you know, will have its octagonal surfaces cut. And the other large piece will go on top of it, and that will just open like a clamshell. A little treasure box for tools there in the middle. So, I hope this is of interest. I hope that you see that you can take firewood and get some very, very nice blanks out of it. Especially when you're doing carving work. What you're not going to really get out of um, firewood is flat, linear lumber. Not really a great source of that. Occasionally, you'll get a little bit of a board. So, this is one that's split too thin for its intended purpose. I was working around a knot. It was a piece that I was about to put up on the firewood pile. I thought, you know what, I'll give it a try. See where the grain goes around that knot. I just split out too thin there. But this could be, you know, hewn down and be something close to a board. But you're not going, and I'm gonna keep it, right? I'm definitely gonna keep that piece. But you're not gonna get a lot of nice dimensional boards out of firewood. But you can get really amazing carving stock of great species out of firewood. So it's another nice little opportunity to practice your green woodworking skills, to get some low-cost wood, and to enjoy yourself. Now this needs to season, and it will be several months seasoning, so a video on making the uh, toolbox uh, is something that I do plan to do. Hopefully this winter, we'll see how time goes, we'll see how it seasons up and what it, how, how events transpire. But you do, I do want to make the point that when you're doing this, you do need some patience. Because it does take time to dry. But, if you've enjoyed this, and you've had enough patience to watch it all the way through. I hope that you'll give it a thumbs up since the YouTube algorithm knows it's worth watching and showing to others. And I'll see you next time at Old Ways Rising Park.